Point Church, good to see all of you here today, whether you are physically here in our building or online, welcome. We're so glad that you chose to join us today. You know, I was thinking, of, I was driving in here today, th there's really two kinds of people as, as you're getting ready for, for church. You're, you're either having a great week and you're like super excited, like, you know, you just sat down, <laughs> turned on the TV or your computer, you got a cup of coffee, things are going really, really well, um, or you're on the other side of going, you know what, I barely made it in today. I, I barely have enough energy to turn on the computer. Um, I barely got here to church, and I'm, I'm having a rough week. In Philippians, the Bible says, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Which, you know, is like the, the church answer, and I get all that, but did you know that that verse was written by Paul while he was in prison? So here's a guy who's in prison. Things are not going well. And he said, listen, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. The great thing is, is that regardless of what's going on in your life, there is a God who cares about you, who knows about your burdens. And what he's asking you and what he's asking me to do is to just lay that down, lay that at his feet and come to him in worship. Would you stand as we worship together this morning? Even in the fire, I'm alive. 
on one thing. Count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. He won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God is never late. He's working all things out. Working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. And yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will. Sing this with me. Count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the way. The same God who's never late is working all things out. Working all things out. Sing it out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy. Something that we've been doing here at Grace Point Church for several weeks now. Churches all across the United States, people all across the United States and the world. At 9-11, we're stopping and we're praying. And we're asking God to bring people back to Him. To turn hearts back to Him. Because with all the chaos that's going on in the world, the only solution is God. Amen? So we want to pause on our service this morning. We want to pray. Would you bow your heads with me? God, we, we come to you as broken, needy people. God, we, we see all the, the chaos in the world. We see all the things that are going on uh, on the TV screens, online. God, people just seem to be at odds in every way, shape, and form. God, they're, they're looking for for peace, God, they're looking for security, and everything that they are looking towards is falling short. God, turn people back to you. God, I, I pray for the hearts of the people 
in this nation. I pray for our leaders. I pray for the people in this state, God, in this county, in our own community. God, we need you. And, and I pray for the people, God, that, that know you. That, that, God, that they won't be so concerned about standing on their rights as they will be in standing in your righteousness. God, as talking to a, a world that desperately needs you. Oh, God, turn our hearts to repentance. God, that in the ways that, that we fall short, God, may we confess that and, and turn back to you. And for those, God, that, that don't know you, I pray, God, that even today, even in this moment, that they, they see you, that they recognize you, and that they accept your free gift of salvation. That is the solution for our nation. God, please, turn us back to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we continue to worship together this morning, would you stand with me? that's aching my trust in you remains you stay the same through the changing of seasons you are the hope when I can't find the reason my trust in you remains my trust in you remains I still believe you are greater I still believe you're in control I still believe you're my healer Jesus you're Yeah. 
Man, it is so good to hear you praising God. Thank you so much for joining us in worship today. We have an opportunity um, to give back to the Lord. And I want to say for those of you that are here for the first time at Grace Point Church, physically here in the building, welcome. We're glad that you chose to be here today. In fact, we have a gift for you. There's a card that we'd like you to fill out. It's a very simple card just giving you some basic information. And then at the end of our time together, just take that card to the guest service counter. We want to give you a gift. And for those of you that are watching online, whether live or, or later on, here's what you do right now. In the comment section, just type in where you are watching. What, what city are you in? What state are you in? What country are you in? Let us know uh, where you are right now. There's a lot of things that go on here at Grace Point Church. And even in the technology age in which we live, we don't always uh, get all the information as we're out there on the interwebs. But there is one way that you can find out up-to-date information. That's signing up for our e-newsletter. How you do that is go to gracepointkitsap.info, click on e-newsletter, type in your email, and you will be up-to-date in all the things that are going on here. We also recognize that we need prayer. And for some of you today, you're, you're hurting. There's just some things going on, and you just want someone to pray for you. We want to do that. On the screen next to me is how you can share those prayer requests. We have a chance to give back to God. Uh, you'll see how to do that, as I said, on the screen next to me. And I was thinking about, about this in our time together. You know, when, when, I, was, uh, when I was a kid, I've, I've, the, I've had the privilege of growing up in church, but when I was a kid, you just kind of gave to God, right? I mean, like, it was just something that you did, and you just came into church, and it was just, it was almost like the, you know, the, the halftime thing that you did in between all the other stuff going on. And it wasn't until I was older that I, I realized the importance of, of giving back to God. See, it, it's not about the, the money part of it. It's about understanding that, that you and I, we, we just manage God's resources, I think about that, the parable that Jesus told about the, the people with the talents, the five, the three, and, and the one. We're just managing God's talents. And for some of you in your career right now, you got a lot of talents. There's a lot of, you got a lot of resources. And for others of you, where you are in your life right now, you don't have a, a ton of uh, resources. But you do have resources, and they're God's. And we get to manage them. And this, what we're doing right now, this is just an opportunity for us to exercise our management skills in giving back to him. So before we do that, would you bow your heads with me as we pray? God, I want to thank you for the, the opportunity to be here today in this moment. God, thanks for letting us be here in this building and hearing your people praise you. God, thank you that in just a few moments we're going to hear from your word. God, thank you for the talents, the, the resources, God, that you allow us to manage. God, I pray that we were to honor you in the decisions that we make with your resources. God, we want to pray for other churches in our community, specifically for Westside Baptist. God, for Pastor Peter and all that's going on in their church. God, as they seek to do what you are calling them to do, we pray for wisdom for them. God, thank you for allowing us to be here together today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hello, Grace Point. Let's try that one more time. Hello, Grace Point. Uh, I am uh, just so grateful and thankful that we have a chance to have some gatherings here and that uh, you are here in person, even wearing masks. Uh, thank you for choosing uh, to do that and uh, so grateful for you. I'm also grateful for so many watching online here in Kitsap County and and uh, we miss you. We look forward to the day that you feel comfortable enough to come back here. Um, but we miss you. Uh, it's great to see what God is doing. Uh, so many people watching online here in Kitsap County. But I want to give a shout out to, to those who are watching in Goodyear, Arizona, uh, Washington, Indiana. That's actually a, a city. Uh, let's see. We have Burke. 
Virginia, Lynchburg, Virginia. We have San Diego, California. And we also need to give a shout out to Brazil. Some people are watching in Brazil. Can we thank those people there? Can we thank those people there? All right. Come on now. Wake up now. Work with me. Work with me. So just, we're just we're blessed to, to see what God is doing. We're in this series called Meaningful Passages, and, and different pastors uh, of our church here are, are teaching what are some meaningful passages for them. Maybe you, you have yours. Those are those go-to passages. Those are those passages that are like, oh man, I, I need to go back to, to this passage and be reminded of. And so that's, that's what we're, we're, we're in and it's good for me to be back. I took some time off. My wife and I celebrated 35 years of being married together. And uh, thank you. I still adore her, love her like crazy, and uh, b- blessed to have uh, Candy as my wife. And so it's good to also sit, like I did last week, and hear the teaching of God's, God's Word from, uh, from other pastors of our church. So if you're joining us today and you have your Bible, you can turn to Psalm 37. This is a meaningful passage in my life. This is one of my kind of recalibration chapters in, uh, in Scripture, refocus, realignment. It's like, okay, I've, I've got it out of realignment. I need to realign again. And uh, this is one of the passages that um, I use. Now, is there anyone here who needs to hear or wants to hear or desires to hear a word from the Lord today? Okay? All right. If you are, say this. Bring it on, Lord. Bring it on. Okay, and if you're watching online, no matter when you're watching, if you want to hear a word from the Lord today, you can put in the comments, bring it on, Lord. Bring it on. Because here's what you don't need. You don't need to hear from me. My words have no power. My words have no uh, changing power in them. But when you hear from the Lord, it could change your life. It could change your life. And that's my prayer is that you would hear from the Lord today. In the passage we're going to talk about today, there is a phrase that says that God will give us the desires of our heart. Which, if we're honest, some of us are like, bring that on, Lord. Bring that on. I got a whole list of desires. Bring it on. Bring it on. But our Heavenly Father is such the perfect Heavenly Father, He won't say yes to all of our list. Because some on our list, some of the desires that we have would actually bring more harm to us than good. And so so to understand this passage, I call that this process, this process of getting the desires of our heart, it's, it's the process of the potter's Wheel. That's what I entitled the message today, The Potter's Wheel. And we begin in verse 1. And this, is a, this is a passage like last week Bob, uh, Pastor Bob talked about. If you have a pen or highlighter, you can circle certain words, underline them. If you don't, I, I've circled them or highlighted them on Scripture on the TV today. Look at verse 1. King David's writing. He says, Do not fret because of those who are evil. Has anybody seen evil? around, you know, have you seen it? Some of you are like, yes, I work with it. Um, but we've seen it in the news. He says, David says, don't fret. That's, that's like, it's not just worry. In the Hebrew, it means to don't get hot, all right? Don't get angry. I, I found myself watching things on TV or hearing about news or watching videos, and I'm getting angry at evildoers. David says, don't go there. Nor do not be envious of those who are doing wrong. Come on, we just be honest. When we have friends, when we have coworkers, we have people that we know, and they're doing wrong, all right? They're, they're doing it when it's contrary to Scripture, and it looks like they're happy, and it looks like they're getting away with it. There, it looks like there's no consequence for their actions. In, in my flesh, at times, I'm going, I wish I could do that. If I knew, I wouldn't get caught. And David goes, don't get angry at evildoers, but also don't be envious of those people who are doing wrong. Why? Verse 2. He says, for like the grass, they will soon wither. Like the green plants, they will soon die away. My lawn in April looked sweet. Right? But I got sections, growing sections of my lawn in the heat of August that are 
withering. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's just a matter of time. So David is saying, don't worry about evildoers and wrongdoers. God will take care of them in time. And then he turns and says, now, what do we do? What should we be focusing on? Verse 3, David says this, trust in the Lord and do good. Trust in the Lord and do what you know is good. Trust in the Lord and do what you know is the right thing to do. Regardless of those people, trust in the Lord and do good. Now that word trust is an interesting word. There's lots of times in scriptures, kind of all through scripture about trusting God, trusting the Lord, trusting the Lord. But this particular Hebrew word means to be safe, to be careless. That's not being like stupid, let me jump off a bridge without a bungee cord. It's like that you trust in God so much, you know that you're safe, and you don't have a care because you know you're in the arms of your Father, Heavenly Father. Now, when uh, my kids were young, I, I, I did what a lot of dads do. We take our kids and we what? We throw them in the air, right? And then we catch them. And, and then all the moms and all the grandmothers, you know, are like, Duh, be careful, be careful. And I, what do I do when I hear that? I just throw the kids higher, all right? And my youngest daughter, Kaylee, she epitomized this meaning of this word. When I would throw her in the air, I could throw her higher than all the other girls that I had because when she went into there, she just relaxed and just was like this. She just, she just loved the whole thing because she knew that her daddy would catch her. Now, I'm not going to mention the name of one of my daughters I'm not going to mention her name, but she, you know, she is the mother of my only grandson and living in Virginia. I'm not going to mention any names. But when I would throw her in the air, here was her response every time. All tensed up. Panic, fear. Every time. So after a while, I'm like, I'm not going to do that. I'll take Kaylee. Woo! You know, she's like, you know, it was like so awesome. What picture describes your trust of God? I'm going to trust in God. I don't, I'm not going to, I'm not going to have, I, I don't care. I've, I've, I'm caring less in a way because I know that he's going to catch me. But how many of us are like this? What is God doing? What are you doing? Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Are you sure you're sovereign? David's saying, trust in the Lord. And then just do what you know is the right thing to do regardless if no one else is doing it. But then the next phrase is this, dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. See, see Dave is a former shepherd. He, he gets animals and taking them to pasture and feed. And what he's describing here is be, this is hard, be content where you are today. Be content with life today. That trust God, and while you're trusting God, I'm being content. This sets up my favorite verse in Psalm 37. Now let's go to verse 4. Verse 4 is this, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, I don't know, can I get an amen? How many of you like this part of the verse? I'm like, I like that verse. I like that part of the verse. God I got my whole list of all my hopes, dreams, desires, and wants. Can you give them to me? Because that would be so cool, right? Again, let me look at this word here. We think it's God's just going to give it to us. The Hebrew word is implying there is an exchange. I don't know, those gift exchange, you know. You give me that, and I'll give you this. And this is what this verse is. You delight yourself in the Lord. That's what we're given to God. And he will give us the desires of our heart. There's an exchange that takes place. Well, what 
does this word mean? Does that word mean that we're supposed to walk around and I'm so delightful to God? I'm just delighting in the Lord. I'm delighting, praise the Lord. You know, God is good all the time and all the time God is good. And we start, we don't mean it, but we, we, we try to act like it. That's not what that word means. This word literally means, this is a good word to maybe if you have a Bible and pen, write it off to the side. It means to be soft and pliable. To be soft and pliable. There's a picture the scripture has is that you and I are the clay and our heavenly father is the potter. And as clay, we need to be soft and pliable in the hands of our potter, our heavenly uh, potter, and allow God to shape and mold us. And he can't do that unless we are soft and pliable. And when we are, that is a delight to God. Delight to God. Now I'm going to read a passage from Nehemiah. You don't need to turn there, but it talks about this, this picture that God wanted the prophet Jeremiah to see. Jeremiah 18, verse 1, it says, This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. He said, Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. There's that potter's wheel. Verse 4, but the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. It was contaminated. It was corrupted. There were things in there that shouldn't be there. So the potter formed it into another pot, meaning he formed it in such a way that it looked different. He says, shaping it or changing it as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. He said, can I not do for you, Israel, as this potter does, declares the Lord, like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, Israel. If you're taking notes, here's the central point. Hope you don't miss this. This is my my experience walking with God for many, many years, is that my fulfilled desires will be the direct result of being soft and pliable in the potter's hand. My fulfilled desires, all right? We all want our desires fulfilled. My fulfilled desires are a direct result of being soft and pliable in the potter's hand. That when I come to God and I am like soft and pliable clay, he's gonna push me and shape me and mold me And what happens is, is that my desires begin to line up with the desires of God that he firmly planted in me, really from from God's original design. All of us are, are made to be a little bit different and unique and one of a kind. But when I am hard and stubborn, God has to take drastic measures to put me in a position to be soft and pliable, and it usually involves pain, all right, and heat, all right? They'd break break the the jar and and heat it up, heat it up, and then it becomes soft and pliable again, so then the potter can then make it the way it was originally designed. So what, what what I put together, I found this video, long video, and I cut it down and edited it, add some music, and I wanna walk you through what happens on the potter's wheel with clay? So let me walk you through this process. Go ahead and take a look. Watch how messy this process is. And that's us right there. That's the clay. And constantly in this video, you'll see water is being applied. Water is always being applied. And, and the potter's wheel spins. And then the hands of the potter is shaping and pushing and forming and always bringing water to it. Notice how the potter's hands, both hands are usually on the clay, but he's got to push deep inside and press in deepward, putting constant pressure, shaping this into the vessel that he wants, reaching deep down inside and pulling up, adding more water to keep it soft and pliable, always doing things to shape it. He's got to press, he's got to push, constantly applying water, 
to move it in the way it needs to go. See, the potter has an idea, the right perfect idea of the design that he has for this, for this jar. Notice the details. But then there comes a time when it needs to be sanded, the rough edges smoothed out. There needs to be a, a cutting away, a removing of what doesn't belong and what is not needed in this jar. More tender applying. After the heavy lifting, the heavy pushing, then it's the tender touch of the potter's hands. Moving it and shaping it. And then I love this part, adding its own unique design. This is going to be a one of a kind, and God has made each of us unique and one of a kind, using different things, different instruments to add his design, his touch. God will use anything in our life, if we allow him to, to end up being exactly the design the potter had in mind. That is the picture of being on the potter's wheel. So I don't know what your desires are. I can guess because we got human beings in here. And you're, some of your desires are similar to others, but maybe you have some unique desires that maybe you haven't shared with anybody yet or only with the few. Maybe you're here today and you're, and you're, and you're in the room or watching and you go, you know what, the deepest desire is I so want to love and be loved by someone else. I want to share my life together. I want, I, want to, I want to get married and spend time loving and being loved. Maybe you are married and, and, and you've been trying to have a child and it's not happening yet and you're beginning to panic. You begin to go, okay, God, are, are, are we going to be able to have a child? Or you have a child but you, you want to add to your family and it, again, it's just not happening yet. Maybe you're like, I'm, I'm in an apartment or I'm renting a house, and, and one of these days, one of these days, I want to be able to own a house and gain equity and make it as an investment, but right now it seems impossible. Maybe deep down, you've always had a desire, okay, you're doing this to get money, but I, you really want to, to start this business, and it's a risk, and, and your heart flutters when you think about it, but you can't get it out of your heart and your mind to start a business, or maybe you are a business owner, and, and your business was doing well, then COVID-19 hit, and, and now it's like it's, my, my business is, is struggling. It's, it's been shattered, and, and your deepest desire is to see it come to life again, become whole. Maybe your kids are married, and you have no grandchildren, and, you're, and, and you keep bugging them. Like, I, I, I need a grandson, I need a granddaughter. And they're like, we're trying. You're like, okay, that's too much information. But, but it's your passion. I want to be a grandparent. I want to retire well. Or maybe you have a desire that no one can see. It's not obvious. But things have happened in your life, and inside you're like, I am broken. I am wounded. I have been hurt. I have been abused. And I would love, I would love to have some measure of health again. I, or you're in bondage in some way, and, and you're like, one day I would love to have freedom in my life again. You could go on and on, and maybe you have desires that I didn't mention, but it's still there. It's real. It's, it's not new. But what are your desires? So what do I do? What do you do? If you take a notice, the first step, this is hard, the first step is to climb on top of the potter's wheel. That has to, to okay, God, I, I'm gonna, I, I recognize that I am the clay, you are the potter, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose to allow myself to get on the wheel and allow you to start spinning it and allow it to, you start to move it, and I, I get it's going to be messy, but I, I'm scared. 
So that's why verse 3 comes back into play. Verse 3 is, I trust in the Lord. Are you going to rest in the Lord? Are you going to be careless in the hands of the Lord? Do you really trust him? Or you're like, God, I don't know. And so that's going to take a lot of you know, faith to actually trust in the Lord. And I'm going to be content with whatever God wants to do in my life. It's not, now, so now you're talking some serious uh, faith muscles being exercised. I'm going to get on top. I, I'm a marred piece of clay, and I have fashioned myself in a different desire. Now I'm going to humble myself, get on the potter's wheel, and God's going to push me. And he's going to press on me. He's going to put pressure on me. He's going to dig deep inside of me, and you've you got to be okay with that. That's the first step. But then once God starts spinning you and pressing you and reaching inside, you, you need the second step, is that you, you've got to stay on top of the powder's wheel. You've got to stay there. You've got to remain there. Because I guarantee you it's going to be uncomfortable. You're going to be outside your comfort zone. You're like, God, but this hurts. God goes, yeah, I know. You got, I, got a, you got a, I got a marred piece of clay, and I got to refine you, and I got to dig deep inside of you. And God is the only one that can start from the inside out. And yes, it's going to be messy, but he's going to keep applying the water and, and keep pushing and keep pressing and keep pulling up and moving and cutting things away that need to be cut away. And that's why you've got, you got to be determined, God, this is scary, this hurts, but I am choosing to stay on top of the wheel. And that's why verse 5 is so critical and so difficult. Verse 5 says this, now commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. I need to commit to the Lord my way. What, what does this word mean? I need to commit to the Lord, not be committed. I'm committed to staying here. No, it's commit your way. Commit your ideas. Commit your desires. Commit your timeline. Oh, now it gets hard. This word literally means in the Hebrew, it means to roll away. See, that goes against everything that we, we've been raised, all right? We have something that's important to us, a deep-seated heart desire, and what do we do? We do this to it, right? And God goes, no, no, no. If you want to be on the potter, potter's wheel, roll it away. Not chase after it and grab it back, but to let it go. This is like surrender, fully surrendered. This is hard. It's one thing getting up on top of that wheel and trusting God, but then when God begins to shape and says, okay, you have your way. How about doing things my way? Because my way is going to fit you the way you were designed. you got to surrender that. you got to commit your way. you got to have it roll away. And one of the most difficult prayers, most challenging, scary prayers, is to tell God, not my will, but your will be done. I'll tell you, that's scary. Because we have our way, we have our desires, we have our timeline, we have our will. And to do this to God and to allow him to do as he seems best is not only scary, but I tell you, you will never really see the full desires of your heart that God has implanted in you to come to be. See, many of our desires of, are, are borrowed uh, uh, desires. We, we see a friend and, oh, they're doing this and they want that and, oh, it works for them. Like, well, I want that too. But that wasn't your de design or destiny from God. Or, or maybe your parents really were, the, you know, pressing on you and pushing you to do things. Some of you, you joined the military because your dad really wanted you to and you, went, you did it to please him, but you never went to God with that. I'm not saying that God can't work in spite of that. I'm not saying to quit now, finish out your commitment. But have you truly said, God, here I am. Do what you want. You see, all in that video, I kept going. He's applying water. He's continually applying water. It's constantly, that's the only way that clay stays soft and pliable is a continual application of water. And what happens, you remove the water and the clay just dries up and becomes hard. 
And the Bible is full of pictures. The Bible is filled with analogies and metaphors. More for in Scripture, in Scripture, do you know what water is a picture of? A metaphor for two reasons, two ways, two pictures. One is the Holy Spirit, being under control of the Holy Spirit, and also the Word of God. Jesus gathered his, his disciples, and in John 7, he, they're, they're still kind of reeling with, you're, you're going to die, you're going to get arrested, you're going to die, and then you're going to leave us? And their minds were just locking up. And in John chapter 7, Jesus says, if you believe in me, you will experience rivers of flowing water within. Next verse. It says, and Jesus said that because he was referring to the coming Holy Spirit. That we have to fully release and surrender and listen to the Holy Spirit. If we do, that's that water, 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 making us soft and pliable, keeping us soft and pliable. Ephesians chapter 5, it talks about being washing by the water of the word. The word of God washes and cleanses us. And that's why you need more than just a Sunday morning, more than just a, a podcast or, or a service online. You gotta be in the word. You gotta maybe start a Bible reading plan or like, okay, God, I need to be under your word. That constantly be washing by the water of the word. word. That will keep you and I soft and pliable. The opposite is true. We don't put ourselves under the word of God and we don't listen to the Holy Spirit. We'll become hard and hardened and not soft and pliable. You see, when I was younger, one of the most difficult decisions in my entire life before or even since was that I had a desire and God was calling me to roll it away and give it to him. See, I found this girl in college. And instantly I was like, that's the girl for me. And I began to pursue her, and, and I would pursue her, and we would get close, and I'd get my hopes up, and then she'd move away uh, not emotionally and stuff. And then I'd pursue her, and we'd get close, and, oh, okay, this is going to work out. And then she drifted away. It's like, no, no, no yeah, I, I, I can't see myself with you. And then I would get close, and she kept doing this for two years. And on one spring break, I didn't have money to fly home to California, and for some reason, all my, uh, you know, go to Florida with some friends or go up to Pennsylvania, all my plans got shut down. And I found myself on virtually an empty campus during spring break, bored to tears, and I was like, I got I to gotta talk to God about this. this. This girl's driving me crazy, and my heart is just, just being crushed and, and up and down, up and down. I don't like roller coasters anyways, let alone a relationship that's on roller coasters. And in my dorm by myself across the hallway was an empty room, completely empty room. And I was like, that's my prayer room. And I went in there every day. And I'm crying out to God, God, give me this girl. You know, she's perfect. And on one day, it was one of those epic battles with God, and I'm in this room by myself, and I would read God's word, and then I would pray. Actually, I was more whining and complaining, and I remember walking like in big circles around this room. Okay, God, come on. I've been chasing after her, and we get close, and, and, I, and then she pulls away, and God, I think she's everything I desire, and, and why, why can't you make her heart turn, and, and why does she keep hurting my heart, and I just kept going around and around and around, and in that moment, the Holy Spirit said something. I knew when you hear me say I heard from God, it's like, okay, one, well, I know that thought didn't come from Satan, and I, it wasn't even on my radar, so it's not for me. And the Holy Spirit said, do you trust me, Barry? Do you trust me? And I was like, well, of course I trust you. I trust you with salvation. I trust you with my future. But God, give me this girl. And in the quietness, when I finally shut up, God was like, but do you trust me? And I remember wrestling with God and realizing I'm not winning this argument. I said, yes, I trust you. I don't understand you, but I trust you. And in that quietness, God said, give her to me. Let her go. 
And I was like, oh, no, I don't know. You know, because I know what that means. If I let her go, I'll never see her again. And it's, oh, no. And I kept arguing with God. And then I kept hearing, do you trust me? Do you trust me? And I remember the moment when I said out loud, and my arms did this, and I said out loud, okay, here is candy. She's all yours. And then I got scared. I'm never going to see her again or have her again. And was, God was like, well, you don't have her now. <laughs> Stop. And then a thought came to me that God, as my Heavenly Father, wants, wants what's best for me. And in that moment, I out loud said this. Well, then if candy's not the best and you have someone better, then bring her on. And I immediately said out loud, I'm surprised I wasn't struck by lightning. And I said, but God, I don't think you can top candy. But that was the moment, the battle that I surrendered and I said, she's all yours. And I honestly did this and I knew it was, the battle was over. And I was scared, but I was like, I'm going to trust God. Put my feelings over here, I'm going to trust God. Then God goes, okay, now you got to apply verse 7. Oh, I, this is the verse I do not like in Scripture. Maybe you have one of those verses. Verse 7, be still before the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Be still. That Hebrew phrase, super complicated. Let me try to do my best. Hopefully you can understand what it means. I'm going to Americanize the Hebrew word. It basically means Shut up. Stop arguing with the Lord. Stop debating the Lord. Stop trying to leverage the Lord. Stop trying to manipulate the Lord. Be still before the Lord. And then wait patiently. Oh gosh, this is hard. Remember the day I told Candy, you know what? You need to go live your life, and I need to live mine. It's just not meant to be. really care for you, but I, I need to say goodbye. And I walked away. Had a change, completely changed my schedule, my eating times. And I was hurting big time. Now, thankfully, because once God made uh, I made myself soft and pliable. Thankfully, sometime later, instead of me chasing her and, and, and she moving away, I stayed and she drifted and then God brought her back to me. But I'll tell you, that's not, that's not all the time in my prayers. Fifteen years ago when God called me here, I had a whole list of desires for this church. And God hasn't answered most of them. Some of them. I'm still here. I've debated God. I haven't been still. I remember driving out to Shelton for a gathering of our pastors and wives, and the whole way there, I am angry at God and yelling at God and saying, you know, I just want to see more people saved. I think I want more people saved in Kitsap County than you do. I actually said that. I'm, 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 I'm alive to tell you that. And about five years ago, I took all my desires for this church, and I went like this, came back to this passage. And I'm still here. This is not my church. It's not your church. Jesus is the lead pastor of this church. But I'm more content and more at rest. I still have the desires. I still got my list that only God and I know. But I'm just a marred clump of clay. And I'm like, I'm content to be on the wheel of the potter in every area of my life. And it's not fun, but I tell you, in every area I do that, God has shaped and molded his desires and has actually fit me the way I was designed that I never knew. And I'm incredibly grateful for the potter's wheel. 
I tell you, back to the central point, I'm speaking from experience. Hopefully you can get there or are there. My fulfilled desires have been and will be the direct result of me being soft and pliable in my potter's hands. Both hands. He always has both hands on me. And I'm choosing to allow the water of his word and the water of the Holy Spirit to keep me soft and pliable. May you experience God like never before as you commit, it's hard, scary, commit your plans to God. Would you pray with me? God, um, thank you for teaching me some very hard lessons. Thank you that Many years ago, I came across this passage, and I have gone back to it time and time again as a recalibration of my heart, and I humble myself and say, God, I am just a marred clump of clay, and when I try to fashion myself or my desires in in, in my way, I, I make a mess of it, God, I surrender. God, do what you will. Not my will, but your will be done. And God, I pray that those who choose to follow you in this, in this word, that they will experience you in ways they've never experienced, and it's going to get messy, it's going to get scary, but may they see your handiwork in their life like never before. And we pray this. In the name of Jesus, we say, amen. Let me talk to those watching online or on the computer. We're going to have some discussion questions. Uh, I challenge you to go through them. They may be hard. But to be honest and go through them, I just want to thank you for joining us today here at Grace Point.